Hey guys, welcome to the r slash Chelsea FC podcast, a podcast which covers everything Chelsea and brings on a new guest from the Chelsea FC Reddit page each week. I'm your host Jack and today I'm joined by Nick, who has played goalkeeper on a competitive level. Today we're going to be talking about Chelsea's goalkeeping situation and other Chelsea topics. So Nick, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah. Um, so on Reddit, my username is iStyle311. Uh, on the Discord, my name is Flips. Um, I've been playing football my whole life, but in the last few years, primarily been just playing in six and seven aside leagues, which would be more like a Sunday mm-hmm. league. Um, and I just like to bring a different perspective to the game from the back of the field. Yeah, so today, as I said, we're going to be talking about Chelsea's goalkeeping situation because obviously we are in in a bit of a sticky goalkeeping situation. You know, we've got the most expensive goalkeeper in the world sat on the bench to Willy Caballero. Um, I'm just going to be asking Nick a couple questions about who, what he thinks about Kepa, you know, do we need a new goalkeeper and such. So I'll start off and I'll ask you, do you think people's perception of Kepa is lower because he doesn't move at times when he knows he can't save the ball? Um, yes, and, you know, purely from the fact that just nobody wants a keeper that's going to stay planted. They want to see him at least, you know, trying. I mean, obviously, yeah. there's, the, there's the time when, you know, you get an absolute world-class shot that just stuns everybody. And even the keeper, if he can't see it happen, he won't react. He'll be caught in place and kind of can't blame him. But there have been way too many times this season we've seen Kepa with feet planted. Yeah, I can actually tell you that um, for 14 of the 47 goals he conceded this season, he didn't move. 14. 14 of the 47. I mean... It, it doesn't. It doesn't fill you with confidence, does it? No, especially because I can't believe that fourteen of those shots were world class. You know. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, obviously, we all know that free kick from De Bruyne when we played Man City. If you remember that. Oh yeah, but well, I mean, from <clears throat> from uh, De, from De Bruyne, it's to be expected. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, that, uh, that that was unsavable. But uh, I mean, just from. If it, 14 shots and you know you take out De Bruyne's and that's way too many left over yeah 100% um, I think it's just from people who don't particularly understand that if a shot's unsavable you know a keeper it's just better off for them not to dive like a lot of fans who aren't so um, like involved in actually everything behind Chelsea, they're just kind of more watch the games. They all just think, oh, he could have got to that, you know. He didn't even try. He's just lazy. He's not a good goalkeeper. So that's why I kind of think it uh, hinders him. That I I would totally agree with that. Um, you know, I I thought about this a lot. Just that it really would be kind of a benefit if there was more technology into being able to kind of have a camera to see what the keeper sees and, and I mean obviously nothing too invasive but just yep. what people don't realize is that so often when a box is cluttered you know in all the players especially on a set piece where they're wrestling with one another and pulling at shirts and there's just yeah, a collection of jerseys in front of you if, you're, yeah, if, you're, if your line of sight is broken of when that ball leaves you know, another player's foot for the shot that cuts down your reaction time. And, you know, you might not see the ball till it's rounded the wall. And at that point you don't have a chance to dive for it. And yeah, like I yeah. Know most, most fans would want to see their keeper at least make a diving attempt at it. You know, they want to see I mean, him try. Yeah. 14 out of 47 is just outrageous. Yeah. It's, uh, that, at least that's what I think. I think uh, that's awful. I agree. Right. So, moving on to the next question. So, which reason do you think had the biggest impact on Kepa's poor saving record? 
Lamp's new style of play with a high line or Kepa's low confidence? Um, in that one, it's definitely a mix of both. You know, with, yeah. with the with the addition of inconsistent defensive lineups, you know, there, there were so many times a season that from one game to the next, we did not see the same back three or back four or any, whatever we were doing in the given situation, playing with each other. There was always definitely. a swap in center backs, you know, Christensen, Zuma, you know, Rudiger, Christensen is just, they were never week in, week out. There was no consistency to the core. And I mean, from a keeper's perspective, you know, to make your decisions and to make them quickly, you have to trust in what the players in front of you are doing. You know, you have to trust their judgment calls, you know, almost second nature. And I just, in Kepa's defense, in a lot of those, you know, he might not have felt the trust in the players in front of him. He might not have known what, sure. what was going to come through next. And it's, uh, you know, to play devil's advocate for Kepa, it's sometimes you have to be able to not think about those things. <clears throat> your defenders have to let you just do your own thing because you know where they're going to be every time. Yep. I mean, you really, when you were waiting for the lineup to come out before a match, we we really never knew who was going to be playing in that defensive line. You know, it really did kind of change in week in, week out. Um, so I, yeah, I definitely agree that 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 can't, that really can't have helped um, his confidence. You know, not knowing who he's going to be playing behind. Well, and not only that, but you know, in the change of central defenders, you think back to when we had Terry or Cahill back there. You know, even if one of the other two was out, both of them knew how to step up and you know, kind of structure the players on either side of them. They yep. they knew what was expected of them to to keep some organization and discipline on the back line. Yeah, I just I don't see that in any of our defenders right now, minus Dave. 100%. Which from the right back position, if that's where he is on the day, you know he can't keep our left back in in place. He but mm-hmm. on that same note, the addition of Chilwell and Thiago Silva. I think does fix that problem for us. Um, Definitely. You know, Chilwell, we know when Chilwell's on the sheet, we know where he's going to be every time. You know, it, yep. it, it's, I think that, co- that consistency and especially with the leadership of Tiago Silva, uh, I'm expecting really, really good things from the back line next season. And I think it's going to help Kappa too, if he is in fact still our goalkeeper for that. Um, I think it's going to allow him to, you know, have, have a little bit more faith in the players in front of him. And I mean, you know, at any level that has, that feels good to just to know that, you know, you have a little bit more of a shield. Yeah, definitely. I'm actually going to catch you off guard with a question here. Okay. And just quickly ask you, who do you think will be, if you had to pick four defenders who are going to play the most minutes next season, who do you think you'd pick? Who played the most minutes next season? I would definitely go for Chilwell, uh, yep. Thiago Silva, yep, Dave, yeah, and the last one's tough. Uh, I really think, I, I, personally, I think Zuma, just because I feel like yep. I feel like the speed of Zuma, he can kind of be Thiago Silva's like right hand, like aggressive right hand you know Tiago Silva definitely he, he I mean with his age now you know he's not going to be the yeah. one that's he, he still somewhat can make those sprints but with Zuma's speed he could just tell Zuma to go and, was, yeah, and, definitely. I, and I still feel safe with Tiago Silva in the back that was actually the exact four that I was going to say funnily enough <laughs> and um, I, I do think at this point that it kind of you know we know Dave still has some in the tank I don't Tiago Silva still has some in the tank, yep. and I think I think he's going to help a lot in shaping Zuma in the next year or two. I, I was I was all for that free transfer. Obviously, I mean I'm guessing you saw all the posts on Reddit, and quite a few people are actually saying that 
they wouldn't want him because of his age. That's, uh, obviously, that's one of the obviously reasons we, I do want him. Yeah, obviously, I mean, I'm guessing you watched the Champions League final. Uh, I think I think he put on a, a pretty solid performance, if I'm going to be honest with you. And the guy, you know, the amount of trophies he's won through his career, he's he's going to be a massive, massive addition for us. And I think he's really going to help organise the defence. Oh, no, I'm, I totally agree because, you know, if you look at the overall experience of our squad at the moment, while there's so much excitement around it, there's, you know, there's still a lot to be proven. And uh, yeah. I just really, to be able to get Silva on a free is, I mean, to buy that type of experience, you know, is one thing, but to get it on a free, it, it's, I think it's massive. Yeah, 100%. I mean, something I can tell you is that in all competitions last season, Chelsea conceded 79 times, which was our worst defensive performance since 1990 to 1991 season. And to still get top four. And we still got top four. <laughs> Level points with, top, uh, with third. But, no, but it's, uh, you know, it, it's trying to, to have to come to terms with the fact that we allow that many goals is tough as a fan. You don't want to have that type of stress each weekend, seeing yep. goals go in like that. <laughs> you know, just it, it definitely. You, while we were always excited for the attack, at the same time we were kind of dreading <laughs> the counter. It, it's it was a give and take each game. You know, some more than others, but uh, no, I'm I'm happy to see where our defense is going in this. Yeah, there there was nothing worse than the the game we played against West Ham to sum it up, where. Uh, we actually ended up losing, but I think it was we were we were a goal down, and we ran up and we managed to equalise in the dying minutes. And now I'm thinking, oh, you know, one point's not enough. We need to go for all three. And then Bowen, the Ukrainian for West Ham, just went down and you know banged in the next goal, and we lost to West Ham. And, you know, it's just. That sort of playing against such a, a a low team in a division, and just you know bottling it because of our poor defensive style, and losing the game to an easy opposition. Well, that was, in a way, that was kind of the theme of the season, though, wasn't it? I mean, it, it was definitely. Uh, you know, especially when we look at back at the game against Liverpool, you know, and how Mount absolutely bossed his way through the entire midfield and yep. just like but those games you know like you mentioned West Ham your Burnleys you just it, it's oh. it's yep. those are never never the they're most not comfortable games are they? they are not they're far from it I don't think there was a single game this season where I felt comfortable and that we were definitely going to win Funnily enough, other than Manchester City, where we won 2-1. I don't know why, but I just had a feeling we'd win that game because of, obviously, Man City plays such a high line and I think we're so good on the counter. But game, like your Burnleys, as we've said, um, Aston Villa, like Everton, just these clubs that are, aren't are nearly near our level, you, you'd never felt comfortable. You never thought that's it, we're definitely winning because you always knew that we were uh, one mistake away from conceding three or four. Uh, definitely. I mean, it's, when, I, when you mention, you know, teams like that, I think of Wolves. I mean, oh, just, yeah. they were they were just so aggressive. And it's, it's you saw it even before, you know, before the half came around, just that, like, our game plans always had to change in those games, yep. types of games, because the, we really didn't know what those types of teams were going to come at us with. If they were going to sit back and, and just, you know, expose Definitely. us in the counter. And they, and look, they, this season, all those types of teams saw our weakness. Our weakness was our defense and our keeper. Yep. And, Definitely. and that was what every team wanted to expose. It was, it was an easy target to see. And, uh, and we, just, yeah, it, they, we got exposed on it quite a lot. Yeah, definitely. That that one hundred percent. I mean I I went and saw the game at home 
against Everton where we actually won 4 0. And I think that was actually one of the few matches this season where I've genuinely felt comfortable with the win. And that's saying a lot considering we came in fourth. Yeah, and you know, as exciting as it was to get back to football after mm-hmm. you know, after the break, it did it did still bring you know, its own stress back into my life with yep, definitely with, with some of those <laughs> games. I mean, it will, you know, it was super exciting after the break to see Pulisic come back and uh, oh yeah, and just to, to see him want to prove himself so much in the squad. Um, and as an American, you know, obviously there's that excitement. Uh, yep. So there's that disclaimer. But I was on the hype train long <laughs> before that. Uh, not Pulisic, Chelsea, but yep. Uh, but yeah, it's. It, I really feel like in this transfer window, we've gone for the the targets that we needed to to strengthen yeah, our backline. We know our attack is is good. It can only get better from here, especially with uh, the addition of a certain German that we may, oh, yeah. may not have gotten. And, so. Uh, and yeah, uh, I, Wait, just, I mean, I mean, which German really? <laughs> I, don't, I don't. I mean, obviously Timo because we saw him score yesterday and in his first friendly for the yep. club but uh you know he got the goal for germany yesterday but then i think there was somebody that didn't play in that game but yeah uh, uh, a certain mr kai Havertz, some would say yeah and and what's funny enough is that you know i'm sure you saw it too with the uh people tracking the flights from Stuttgart. oh yeah <laughs> and i think they were pretty damn spot on with that yeah so do i i I always find it funny. Um, every time that a, a transfer is closing in, I always look to see who's actually looking at all of the flight records and stuff. I just find it hilarious. Well, I don't know. If, I, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but you know, in post post pandemic, well, I mean, obviously still a pandemic, but you know, kind of in the pandemic era, uh, mm-hmm. I feel like it's flight tracking is a little bit more on easy mode. Because yeah, obviously, definitely. <laughs> so you know, <laughs> they kind of had the skies cleared for him a little bit to do the tracking. But look, they were still spot on with it, and uh, now it's exciting to see that Havertz finally put the pen to paper, and man, for sure, it's going to be in the Chelsea jersey next season. Just something I actually wanted to say about Christian Pulisic. I actually was different to you. I wasn't on the hype train when he signed. I thought it was an outrageous fee. And I thought we were mainly doing it for, well, to sell kits. Uh, that's just me being honest. And, I mean, wow, has he, you know, he's disproven that, hasn't he? He's He's been immense, really. Uh, it, no, and look, I don't think you were the only person in for sure. w- with that feeling. I think the majority were probably more like that, especially, in, and just from my perspective, I feel like there's kind of always been this, this, you know, feeling that it really is going to take a lot for an American to prove himself in the Premier League. You Definitely. Know, obviously, Clint Dempsey was something for Fulham, but, you know, yep. at, at Fulham at the time, it was just, uh, he was kind of a, a diamond in the rough, more or less. But, um, and, you know, Tim Howard for Everton. Yep. But, you know, with Pulisic to come into a squad like Chelsea and to do what he has done because at the beginning it wasn't great you know he, mm-hmm. he but for him to fight back so hard and and just what we've seen from him since the restart it, yep. it's anytime he touches the ball it, it's I get, I haven't had the goosebumps since Hazard you know just that something is about to happen just because the ball's at his feet and for sure it's 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 fun to watch and the players were adding around him I mean just thinking about the far post runs and the balls in on the wing from Ziyech is just I'm excited I'm, I'm, it, it, it's very exciting isn't it I actually have a quite interesting stat on Pulisic he recorded 7.6 box touches per 90 so touches in the box uh, and that was 6th in the league only behind Mohamed Salah Sergio Aguero, Gabriel, Gabriel Jesus, um, David Silva, and Raheem Sterling. 
So, you know, when when we'd see him kind of dribble his way in and then win a penalty, especially since the restart, it, that's an incredible stat in my opinion. Well, and especially since his, you know, first season in the league. It's uh, yep. it, when we think about the other players you just mentioned, you know, they've all been doing it for a few years now. They know what to, they know how to, they know how to do it. You know, yep. Pul- Pulisic had to come in and he had to learn it. You know, it was a hundred percent. And that's the thing. He's, he's young. He's really young. We still have he's, a lot to see from him in the I mean, next few years. I think this month he's turning 22. So <laughs> him and, there you go. <laughs> and that's the beautiful thing. It's not just, you know, look at the whole squad. I just, the age right now yep. and to see what growth potential we have I mean, is it's the most exciting thing ha- right. Havertz 21 Timo 24 um, I believe Mount is 22 yep or 20, 22 22 yeah I think it's 22 um, obviously Pulisic is 21 turning 22 I mean H- Hudson Adoy I mean Hudson still, Adoy still how 19? can we forget about him still 19 yep. and that's the thing you look at him now and it feels like in the last year or two just he's in the just you, by looking at him you feel like he's 23 24 but yeah he, definitely he's only about to turn 20 which i mean that's crazy and the, and look he, to keep it on hudson adoy just uh looking at how he was linking up with timo and ziesh in the friendly the other day what I mean, that um that lovely header <laughs> yeah but, but i mean i think he you know might have forgot to open his eyes for it but it was yeah still, maybe it was still maybe nice. <laughs> I think, I think he was uh, quite lucky that Timo was there for him. Well, kind yeah, of but, cover him up there. But I do think that's you know, I think Timo, and that's what he's going to bring to the team is just that uh, he's got that presence of mind to be in the yep. right place at the right time. You know, even for things that are unexpected. Just I feel like he, he's got this different kind of game sense and awareness to him that, I mean, he's going to be lethal it, to see. A, a striker that's actually going to be able to convert, you know. Yep. Obvi- I don't know. We haven't really seen that since Diego Costa, but I think Tiago, or sorry, Timo, will, uh, you know, will do it with a little bit less stress and, you know, a yeah, lot, definitely. a lot fewer yellow cards. I mean, he had twenty three goals in the Bundesliga last season. I'm pretty sure. I mean, would have been, would have had the most had it not been for a certain Lewandowski. Yeah. <laughs> Lewandowski, we call him. Yeah, which I mean, like, it's kind of on the level of, well, he's so far ahead, let's just not yeah. put him in the stats with everybody else right now. R- robbed of the Ballon d'Or, is what I say. <laughs> um, um, I, that, don't get me started on that. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I really feel like, you know, of all the years for somebody else to put on such performance that it's yep. clear cut who should get it, to not have it, it's, uh, it's just unfair. I mean, he was the top goal scorer in all the competitions he played this season, wasn't he? So, um, Bundesliga, I mean, DFB Pokal, Champions League. And didn't he get a goal in every Champions League game? Yeah, uh, he didn't get one in the final. That was the only true, one he didn't get a goal in. True. Okay, I gotta forget that. Yeah, but I mean, so, what a record that would have been! Wow. Uh, just some like one. It's crazy because once you saw his name pop up on the score sheet early in the game you almost knew it was like the seal was broken he was just they were just going to keep flowing after that I actually have quite an interesting story a friend of mine uh, his dad is a taxi driver and he was going to pick up his client from the airport and that client actually happened to be Kepa Arifa Belaga and in that car ride the Champions League fixtures got announced, and um, we got match. We got drawn to Bayern, and Kepa basically said, "Like, well, you know, how are we going to keep out Lewandowski?" And that's not something you hear every day. No, and I mean, first off, that's. He- how trustworthy is this friend? Uh, we we know for oh, a fact that Kepa was. Yeah, in the I, ca- I've got I've got a video <laughs> of him in the car. Man. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, but no, I mean, first of all, it's uh, at this point, you know, 
I think out of all the things we're going to get on Kepa for, I think goals against Bayern, there has to be a little bit of a pass, you know, a little bit less yep. scrutiny on them. Um, just, I mean, it's Bayern. They they just go on a field and dismantle teams one by one. That that team, I mean, I don't think I've ever seen a team win the um, the Champions League and deserve it as much as that team. No, I mean, they just hook every game by the net, scruff of the neck and... Yep. and I mean, they were in total control the entire time. I mean, not yep. for a, never for a second did you doubt that it wasn't going to be a fantastic game by them. A hundred percent. I mean, their eight-two win against Barcelona certainly made our four-one second leg look pretty reasonable, didn't it? <laughs> uh, look, uh, and that's that was the mindset I tried to keep. That was it made me a little <laughs> bit happier to think about it that way. Um, you know, it still makes me a little bit kind of happy because we're seeing the ripples of it even now with the talks of Messi mm-hmm. though I think he did just announce that he's you know, going to he, stay isn't he's he? gonna stay which I, look I really didn't know what to expect from it but he certainly turned the table back on Bartomeu um, yep. with, with what he said but uh, but no I mean Bayern they're you really kind of have to say they've almost just been perfect yep definitely I mean I'm actually quite uh, heartbroken at the fact that Messi isn't leaving because I I don't know how you feel about this, um, but I just think the club are treating him terribly, especially considering he's you know the club would definitely not be where they are today without him, and they're just treating him awfully. I mean, just let him go on a free. I know, obviously. He's a very valuable asset. Like he's drawn them in over a hundred million in revenues every season. But he, it, for someone who has been there for your team through everything, if they're asking you to leave, and he had that clause that let him leave for free, and just because of you know COVID and the season ending when it, where it should have, you know. It, I just think they're treating him terribly and they should have let him go. Look, I, I have to agree with that. I mean, it's when the fact that it came down to just the tiniest of details when, I mean, it could have been kind of like a, a very peaceful resolution, you know, it, it's, yep. I, I'm definitely with you in that I was really excited to see him, now, even though yep. it would have been for Man City. Uh, yeah. You know, it just, it, it would have been, exciting games every weekend knowing to, that Messi was going to be playing um, and look I don't think he was going to fix like I don't think he was going to come into the team and make the most impact immediately I mean yeah it is Messi mm-hmm. but they would have to somewhat restructure the team a little bit um, but you know as, with the with going back to Messi at Barcelona and just when I think about Ronaldo leaving Real Madrid I still think Real Madrid had the identity of the Galacticos. You know, they they were Los Blancos. They Mm -hmm. just, they are still Real Madrid even when Ronaldo's gone. Messi embodies so much of what Barcelona is at the moment. It's like you feel like once he's gone, it's like what kind of team are they? What do, how do they play? Um, You know, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, he is the club in my, my opinion. I mean, it's, I'm kind of happy to see him turn it back around and, and show, the, you know, the fans that look. I I've always loved this club, you know. I will do what I need to for this club. It's just kind of unfair that after 20 years, the club wouldn't do, you know, what they could for me in yep. a sense and put it into Definitely. a power struggle. I mean, Barcelona have spent awfully in the transfer market. Um, uh, it's been, I think it's, really they need a, an, an entire restructure. They um, do. Just everywhere, really. I, I, I was actually I, I was made a video early and I was talking about how I'd rather have our Chelsea team than have Barcelona's team right now. Oh, I'm I, one hundred percent agree with that. I mean, but there's, there's... A, no, sorry, carry on. 
Uh, and I just I would like I was just going to say that you know there's just so much excitement for the future right now. You know yeah. we're you know what we're building towards. You can see you can see the plan in Chelsea yep. and Barcelona. You just felt like let's get who's exciting in the moment and yep. throw him in the team and and hope it works. Yeah, like hope it sticks and it just nothing. It's just been awful. Nothing is going to stick like that. Definitely. Um. Yeah, uh, what was I saying? Um, oh my god, I've completely forgotten what I was saying about Barcelona. Um, yeah, I, I'd much rather have our team, and that's definitely not something that I feel like I should be saying. Considering you know, I know obviously we've brought in a bunch of new players, but we're realistically going to get third in the Premier League maybe next season and we could challenge for the title I shouldn't be saying that I'd rather have our team over Barcelona's team who you know Barcelona have always been known as this complete and utter powerhouse and you know it just shows how poor um, the club's been recently that I, I really wouldn't want to go anywhere near their team but, um, yeah you know um, can't argue with that it's just it's there, there really doesn't seem to be any real game plan with what they're going to be doing, you know, past yep. the next year, past the next season. There's not; they're just trying to solve the current problem year yep. after year. And yeah, I mean, as if I were a I mean, player, if I were a player, you know, looking to go to a club right now, what is attractive about Barcelona? I mean, I just I don't see anything yep. there there at the moment that's that's exciting, other than a few big names, which. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, there's Griezmann, but like, I don't think he's the type of impact player to carry a team. He he needs mm-hmm. a few other players around him. But um, no, I agree. Chelsea, Chelsea's probably one of the most exciting teams in the world right now, as far as yep. looking forward. Hundred percent. Right. Obviously, we've gone a bit off topic here. Uh, I'll just I'll, I'll bring it back to Chelsea now. Um, so I'll ask you. Do you think bringing in a new goalkeeper next season would be beneficial to the club? Um, definitely. Um, I mean, though we do have to look at it from a realistic perspective, you know, transfers, yep. but how much we paid for Kepa, how the market is now after after COVID. And, and, um, and, you know, I just, I don't think we can bring in one that's an outright replacement. I think we do have to bring in one that would challenge him, um, mm-hmm. but not one so expensive that, you know, it, it basically not a permanent solution. We were just talking yep. about Barcelona needing a, a quick fix for now. That is kind of what we need for a keeper. Yep. A stopgap. We we yep. Stopgap is perfect. Um, you know, just right now, Kepa's value is kind of going to be the lowest it's going to be. Yeah, it, it, his form has been so bad. But if he doesn't play, how does his value increase at all? So exactly. uh, I, f- I feel like we really do need to bring somebody in that can challenge him, at least try to get some value back into him, sell him or loan him next season. I mean, we know at this point, we know he's going to be a loss in yep, the books definitely. regardless. We just have to try and minimize that. And if we can get by a year, because like you said, our, re- our expectations are, you know, finishing third, doing better than this past season. Yep. Um, you know, maybe getting some silverware. But with the Liverpool and City sides at the moment, you know, saying we're realistically going to be like a super strong contender for to finish in the league, mm-hmm. like, don't get me wrong, I'd love to see it. But I think with Kappa at the club, yep. we can't say it's that realistic. Now, if we do get that stopgap and say next summer we can get somebody like Andre Onana from, from yep. Ajax, I think that is when we can start saying realistic, you know, realistic expectations for challenging and getting getting top Definitely. of the league. I mean, I think with our current team and obviously the players being so young, we've haven't got everyone in now, all these new transfers, to win the league this year. We've brought everyone in so that we can keep winning the league in a few years. Because when our team, you know, they've had a couple of years playing together it's just going to be unstoppable in my opinion 
Yeah, no, and and I'm right there with you, which is why I think like right now we do need that stopgap because like yep. Kepa's still young, but you know if we could right now Andre Anana is 24. If we could, mm-hmm. if we can really like get him next season, then we're looking at a future because if we can sign him for five years, he's gonna you know grow with this young team we have, and I think mm-hmm. that would be the best case scenario. All right, cool. Um, I'm guessing you've seen the links with uh, Edouard Mendy. Uh, I have, and uh, you know, I do think he would be. If they're talking about that stopgap, I think he would be yep. the perfect stopgap. Um, you know, it just. I really kind of feel that he's family. He, you know, I think he has very stim- similar stats to Czech, from what I've read. Um, uh-huh. You know, Czech does have that connection at Rennes. Uh, it just, yeah, of course. I, I really think, you know, from from what I've seen of him, I can't say I've watched him all that much, uh, but, you know, I have watched as many highlight videos as I could and even, <laughs> even some videos that I've tried to show what he's, you know, a little bit weaker at, but I really yeah. think he would be enough of, a, of an improvement. Well, I say enough, but I say but he'd definitely be a good improvement over Kepa, but maybe still somebody that, you know, Kepo could try and challenge for at least maybe yep. give him a little bit more to work at to replace and uh, yeah I think I think Mendy would be would be a good choice if we could get him. Yeah, I actually saw some interesting stats about Edouard Mendy versus Kepa on the Reddit page, and obviously Kepa we've always kind of backed him up a little bit as being well he's a bit of a modern day goalkeeper and you know. He's really good at passing. Um, I actually have a stat that... So, for attempted passes between 25 to 40 yards, um, the Edouard Mendy is at 56.6% and Kep is at 14.1%. And then pass completion, Kep is at 56.6% completed and... Mendy's at ninety point five percent completed, so I don't know. I just think Edward Mendy is better in most regards, but also he's realistic enough that he can be bought in and have to challenge for that first goalkeeper spot alongside Kepper instead of being someone who's going to outright bench him, and then Kepper's never going to get another game, and we sell him for five mil to some team in Spain no like I'm that, that's the same thought process I would have about it you know just if he's not going to be like the keeper that we start to challenge for you know the top spot but he would be enough to get us through next season help our chances to get third and mm-hmm. uh yeah I think Mendy like Mendy would be be a good player to bring in and yeah I'm hoping it happens, but you know we've spent a lot of money already. Just yeah. <laughs> hope we hope we have a little bit more to throw around. Um, just another interesting fact to put out there: Kepa actually has the worst save percentage in the entire history of the Premier League for players who have played ten or more games, um, with fifty-four point five percent, putting him at seven hundred and thirtieth place. I am not jealous to hold that stat that is <laughs> that is yeah I don't know if there's enough kind of I don't want to pile it on Kepa but I don't think there's really anything good we can say about that yeah or, or any, any good twist we can put on it. it it's hard because I was actually um a big fan of Kepa in his first season under Sari and I I really backed him as you know we're gonna he's gonna improve he's young you look at De Gea's first season in the Premier League and he wasn't great. Um, obviously, he's had a slope and form, De Gea himself. Uh, played amazing against Germany, but just generally for Man United, he's had a bit of a slope of form. But, you know, he's been a world-class goalkeeper and he didn't start great in the Prem. And I always kind of backed Kepa and said he's, he's going to improve. And, you know, he just kept getting me like, I don't know what I can say to keep defending this guy. Um He's just been awful, in my opinion. Uh, there's really not much that I can think to say to kind of back him up. Obviously, we've had a completely new style of play this season. 
with Lampard coming in, our defence has been pretty awful. Uh, obviously, we've brought in a new defensive coach, so that's good. But I just have run out of things to defend Kepa with. You know, the stats that have come out, it just really underlies how bad his season has been. Well, look, that is where you and I do kind of align, is that I have also been a big defender of Kepa mm-hmm. for as long as I can think. You know, I've, I've tried to give him the benefit of the doubt, you know, try to see things from a goalie's perspective. And like you, just kind of started to have those moments where it's like, I can't, I can't defend what, what's happening right now. Um, I really can't mm-hmm. understand why some of these attempts, why some of these shots are going in, you know, just it's, it really did seem like at times he had just kind of totally lost confidence in himself. And, yeah. uh, you know, it, it really reminded me a lot of Murata when we had him. For sure. And I had to kind of think, you know, Murata, like there were flashes of brilliance when we had Murata and, um, and, you know, kind of started to remember some of the stories that, happened like some of the tragic events with Murata when he was at the club you know I think one of his mm-hmm. good friends he lost one of his good friends to a car incident car crash incident um while he was playing in a game his he had a home invasion and while mm-hmm. his wife and two kids were home and stuff that you know would would affect his his state of mind Definitely. uh there was a dip in form with Ashley Cole when he was going through his divorce and I started to think more about off the field matters and you know with Keppa I know I feel like a little while back there's an article that came out and uh you know about his girlfriend he's about his girlfriend of seven years yep. you know and just you know I know we I know if we say foot like football football keep it on the field keep personal stuff off the field but mm-hmm. you got to think when he's already kind of under so much stress at the club yep. un, under you know and then he's got that going on in his life. I, I feel like I just probably compounded, and and he's just kind of gotten crushed under all of it. And I don't know if there's much coming, you know, for him to do to come back from that. Yeah, um, definitely. You know, kind of feel for him in that sense. I've always yep. wanted to see him do good, but it's uh, I don't know. I, I just I feel like. I want to I want to keep hoping for him as a as a person as a player, but to have hope in the Chelsea squad, I really, I just I think we need to get somebody else at the moment. Yeah, um, totally agree with you there. I, you know, I really like how Kepper is so passionate. I always enjoyed how you know he'd you he'd step up. Uh, he'd be trying to save a penalty and. You know, he'd save it and you just see the sheer passion, you know, he, but it's just the confidence that has just completely ruined him. And I think it's got to a point now where there's really not much coming back from it. Um, I think he really needs a loan move away from the club. But what we do, uh, you know, loaning him is going to, just that in itself, it's going to take his value down so much. You know, you see the top goalkeeper in the world being loaned out. You think, well, he's not worth that price tag at all, is he? Like, even his team don't want him. Well, I do have to correct you there. You said top goalkeeper in the world. I, I, I'd say more, most expensive. But if we're going to say oh yeah, top, sorry, sorry. Top, if we're going to say top goalkeeper. <laughs> Kepa can't be in yeah, the conversation. Most expensive. Most expensive. <laughs> but uh, but no, I totally agree. I, really, you know, I don't think alone. I, I, I don't see us. You know really doing a loan just because I still feel like a loan is too much of a loss at the moment. I don't, yeah. too, I don't think from, from a business standpoint. Really. I, yeah, exactly. Uh, I feel like the only scenario that we could kind of come out, I can't say on top, but on top of the loss, mm-hmm. you know, so to speak is just if we do something to kind of inspire him a little bit at the club and, yep. you know, I know a lot of fans won't like to hear, but we do have. I'm just gonna have to be behind him for another season, you yeah. know. And and hopefully, the you know additions and improvements we made to our defense, you know, that mm-hmm. like maybe that will be enough to give him some confidence. Maybe he'll feel yeah. a little bit better because he'll know who's playing in front of him week in and week out. He knows what you know. He'll start to learn what Chilwell can bring, what Thiago Silva can structure in front of him, like 
you know, maybe Tiago Silva will take him under his wing, not, you know, not take him under his wing, <laughs> but kind of like protect him, you know, yeah. just kind of be that, try to be that guardian for him. Um, you know, there's a lot to look forward to in the structure around Kepa this season to maybe help him improve or, you yeah. know, if we have another keeper to just that we can feel safe about. But, um, yeah, I just, I really think at the end of the day, we're going to be seeing Kepa for another season. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people forget that at the end of the day, Chelsea Football Club is a business and, you know, we can't afford to just lose, you know, what was it, 70 million on a goalkeeper. 72.3, maybe? 72. Some, point, so, we, so, so, something like that. You, you know, it was up there. It, we, you know, we can't afford to just lose that as a club. Um, you know, it is a business, and that is, you know, that's a that's a big loss. I mean, obviously, we've had, you know, people that have kind of flopped like Morata, but we managed to recuperate the majority of the money for him when we sold him, um, and that definitely wouldn't happen with Kepa if he was to be sold. So mm-hmm. I do think we're going to have to just keep him for a, at least another season the only way I mean they're yeah I agree because there's really no way we get back especially now post-COVID I mean yep. you know value on the market and it's just he's not going to surpass what we paid for him at any point so it's just how how much we can negate the loss you know just yep. how we want to bring bring it to a smaller deficit if possible but to do that we're going to see him in the team next season I mean, of course, there, was, there wasn't there was really anything too remarkable about him when we bought him. I mean, other than his age, really. I mean, he was a good goalkeeper. Um, maybe you disagree with me on that, but I don't think there was anything too crazy. But obviously, we were in a really bad situation with Courtois just, well, snaking out the club a little bit and going off to Real Madrid. Uh, not in the best way possible. And we obviously had to pay the buyout clause for him and especially you know it kind of still the sour taste in the mouth after you know we decided on him over check for you yeah. know a little while longer but um but yeah well, you're right it was kind of a panic buy after that mm-hmm. uh you know when i when i read the headlines that we were buying you know the most expensive goalkeeper in the world i kind of i guess just assumed it was going to be exciting because yep. i didn't know much about him but um you know, he really we can't say he's he's ever lived up to that price tag. Uh, yeah, definitely. You know, I kind of just wonder how how he ever had the confidence to stand up to Sari and say, "I'm not coming off the field." Mm-hmm. But um, you know, that confidence to do that is definitely gone now. Hundred um, percent. I'm actually just going to move on to the more general questions now. I think we've both kind of established that Kepa, although you know, he may not be the goalkeeper we want. We're kind of stuck with him uh, and we need a stopgap. And yeah, I, f- I think I'm inclined to agree on that, if you are. Yep, definitely. I just, you know, for Kepa's sake, I think he just kind of needs to stay off of social media for the season. And, definitely. Uh, and hopefully we can get the best out of him. And hopefully that best is better than last season. Yep. Right. Oh, it's actually interesting, just quickly, how you kind of mentioned social media and I guess uh, a keeper like Czech who would have been maybe in a, you know, he's not, he hasn't had the best game. Uh, you know, he's not going to have that massive social media, like, you know, the burden, some things that Chelsea fans say to Kepa, which I don't agree with at all. Um, you know, people send him, like, disgusting messages online really you just think that that must make such a massive impact because at the end of the day you know he is only human and to be criticized like that it's it's never going to fill you with confidence is it no and i mean i've I've thought about that myself you know like nowadays people just have such a direct line to to Mm -hmm. you know our athletes celebrities uh just people high high people with a lot of influence or you know and i just i'd never understood the you know the benefit of Mm. sending any of these types of messages i mean like but at the same time you know i 
I don't know. I would imagine there has to be some type of, like, you know, the club has to consider that in, you know, how their players are, you know, absorbing social media, like, because they want to keep their players in a good mindset and and they know those messages are out there. You have to think that the club has something in place to maybe add some type of filter to that. I don't know. Maybe there's something with Twitter that does that, Mm -hmm. but but yeah, I agree with you. I mean, if if these players, especially players like Capo, you know, with one mistake and just you have the world jumping on you and sending you messages like it's it's just it can't possibly put anybody in a good state of mind. Yeah, um, definitely. But no, I, I, just, I just think social media, you know, it, while it can be really good, we saw what Reese James, you know, just did for Wigan. Yeah. With with his message and how much money they were able to raise afterwards um definitely yeah while there's a lot of good there's a lot of bad but i just uh yeah i I don't think any fans of any team chelsea or any other team out there like nothing productive or powerful is going to good come out of you know sending a message you know a hateful message like that yeah i mean uh even with reese james uh you know people were actually you know send him a lot of hate online because he only de- donated three grand to towards the whole Wigan uh, fundraiser it, you know it's just things like that that are crazy how someone can be criticised for you know doing something so good yeah I'm, yeah and like that's the thing it's like I just don't I mean who has any right to say mm-hmm. what is I mean something's better than nothing I mean yep you know nobody should tell you how to spend your money nobody should Mm -hmm. tell him how to spend his money but like at the same time like criticizing somebody for promoting a good message no regardless of the amount Mm -hmm. i mean it's it's there's just nothing productive to come out of it yep agreed right so i'm gonna ask you how many games will mason mount start next season do you think oh uh i mean we know he was one away from you know the perfect Premier League season. Yep. This time, um, and just uh, with the congestion of the fixture list next season, while I do think he's kind of like the little engine that could, he's just if you put him on the field, he's going to give everything he's got. Um, mm-hmm. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say 36. Not wow. I don't, I don't think he'll get. What did you got last year? Mainly, I'm just going to say purely from a rest standpoint. You know, we have so many other options now. Uh, not to say he won't perform, mm-hmm. but I just think if there's a situation where it could benefit us the game after next to rest him, you know, while I would like to see him get the 38, mm-hmm. I just I think, that, you know, this being a congested season because of the quick, rest, you know, we had the restart yep. and now everything is kind of squished together. I think there will be there will be a lot of seasons down the road for him to get that perfect 38. But uh, I think for this one, you know, it's just going to be more of a situation where he'll probably need some rest at some point. I I am um, I, I I cannot believe that answer to be honest with you. Uh, I think it's going to be a lot lower. Um, Re- okay. Because of course our midfield now is well, it's it's pretty. You know, competitive uh, in terms of places. You know, we've got Kai Havertz coming in, um, Kovacic, Kante. Um, you know, I don't think Mount will start as many games as people think. I think he'll start a lot towards the start of the season, and gradually start to get subbed off, uh, subbed on from the bench towards the second half I think there'll be a lot of rotation depending on the game and depending on who we're playing obviously but I'm actually going to say I reckon he'll start maybe 26 games 24 well again you know thinking about it now in my defense I did write down 36 before the announcement of Kai Havertz so um (laughs) so there's that but but no I mean you know we have seen the games where Mount can play play on that left wing um you know just mm-hmm. I, I think yeah i mean 36 36 may have been a bit high but i just i 
we know he's he's Frank's golden boy. You know, yeah, Frank, definitely. Frank Lonson, and and he really just has this work ethic that is kind of infectious to the team around him. And I think a lot of the times that's that's kind of why Frank likes to have him in the starting lineup is just because he brings energy from the very beginning to the very end, and mm-hmm. he helps to bring that same energy to the you know people around him. Interesting, right? Who do you see being our top goal scorer next season? I'm gonna have to answer Timo. Yeah, it's Timo is just he's clinical uh, from everything I've seen. He's just like we mentioned earlier. He knows where to be. He knows in any situation. He knows what he has to do to to get the ball in the back of the net. Um, I did have a little bit of a internal debate just because I can see two different things, just like through balls, Mm -hmm. direct through balls from Havertz to Timo. But at the same time, I'm also just thinking of like the ZH crosses off the wing, go on the far post to Pulisic. So, I mean, I Mm -hmm. think Pulisic could definitely be up there too. I mean, we saw what he did coming back from the restart. I mean, he's just putting him in left and right. Uh, But I think he's going to have to do a lot to keep up with Timo. Yeah, I... Timo is actually um, my favorite current player and he has been for around two years, so uh, a long time before he was linked with Chelsea. Um, I, I've, all, I've always loved him and I was actually gutted when you know all the links started coming out with Liverpool. And I just thought that he would be the perfect, just the perfect fit for our team, the guy that we really need to bring in. And then, obviously, well, we ended up bringing him in, and I just couldn't believe it. For the price we got him, too. I mean, oh. it, was a, it was a great, great I'm, deal. It's crazy. Crazy. It, Ziyech as well. Good price. Yeah, I mean, look, and, I, you know, I think, uh, I don't know what the final price, if the final price for Havertz was announced yet, but the last, you know, report I saw, it was actually... A little bit lower than you know the yeah. eighty million that's been reported the whole time. Definitely. Well, 80, 80 million plus additions, but um, yeah. So I mean, just the business the club has done so far has been absolutely phenomenal. Definitely, es- especially when you consider that um, Zayash was pre-COVID. Was he? I didn't. I yeah. Didn't, wow, that's he, he was because we. That's incredible. We signed him on. Um, so early before all the clubs started losing all this money games were still open and such you know all the revenue was still coming in and we signed him pre-covid uh which was just a ridiculous price i can't remember what it was but i remember it was a you know a very respectable price it's, yeah I, I really i can't wait to watch watch him play oh. because he and i know it's a different position than you know Mata and Fabregas, but I just mm-hmm. I think about the precision at which he could, you know, from almost a standstill. That's what we saw in the friendly the other day. He yep. just he, the ball he stopped and from standing still, mm-hmm. sent this beautiful <laughs> curling ball into the far post. And I mean, just it. That's what Fabregas could do. He could he yep. could change the and he dictate the pace of the game, and then just like to have that eye and the precision is, um, I can't wait. I'm I'm actually kind of um, getting goosebumps just thinking yeah. about yeah to be honest with you oh, I mean it's so easy to picture it's uh, that yeah, cuz Pul- because you could already see Pulisic just, just fly, yeah. flying and then that ball I mean could, oh. you saw uh, obviously when we played them in the Champions League Champions League um how we just pinged them balls over to Promes and <laughs> and then he, you know he he just be in the wide open with no one around him um, it would be precisely to promise and promise would just, you know, stick it in like nothing. And, you know, you're just sat there and you're like, how did that just happen out of nowhere? And, and I think that might have been the moment that Kepa lost any last bit of confidence too when that ball yeah. went off the post straight into his face. Cause yep, that, that, <laughs> that free kick goal. Wow. That, I mean, to know that we were getting him was, uh-huh. uh, yeah, it, it's... I'm excited to watch him play. I think he's going to be a game changer for just what he can bring. I I, I really um, liked Willian and I think he brought a lot to the team, especially in terms of work ethic. But, I mean, I don't think many fans would deny that he did kind of, you know, he'd break down attacks a little bit. 
um, kind of doing the same thing over and over again. And now we have someone like Zayesh who's going to, you know, replace him on the right wing, most likely. It, it, it just, you've just feel like the team is going to be that much better with him in there. Uh, definitely. I mean, yeah, I'm with you there because William, you had to admire how hard he worked. I mean, it kind of, mm-hmm. he, he, well, and look, he did still have some production to him. I mean, yep. but, but that's for the amount of chances that you feel he could have created, just that, and he ended up just stopping on a dime and yep. you, you watched the entire attack fizzle out. You know, there was just, I mean, it was, it just disappointed you more often than not. Um, but to see that, you know, Ziyech can stop, you know, do the same thing. He's stopping on a dime, but then he's sending in the perfect ball. It's just, uh, yeah, I mean, it, I feel like it really opens up the area that, you know, anything can be a threat yeah. from that right I mean, side. If we could have seen, you know, Ziyech passing it over to Ben Chilwell, Ben Chilwell passing it into the box, you know, just, just little, just little things like that, that, uh, are just going to, you know, bring so much to the team that I, I'm i not even sure, talking about it, I quite know how much it's going to bring to the team yet because you think we've got, uh, we're going to have like six new players in the starting lineup. Wow. It's, look, it's, all I can keep thinking about is how young the entire team is too. Yes. It's, it's just to know that, that we're past, kind of those rough periods of where we're mm-hmm. replacing the likes of Terry and Cahill and Ivanovic yep. and just like it seems like for once this is where the rebuild is yep. you know really taking form and it's just there's so much to look forward to and of course um, so realistically the the team that we were most uh, on level with last season was probably Man United um, and to see that they you well, they made a signing just a few days ago obviously Donny van der Beek but you see how our team has done this transfer window and you look at theirs and you just think we're miles ahead of them now oh for sure because you know there's a lot of discussion about where van der Beek is going to even fit into that team yeah definitely um, and but you look at what we've done and we've you know we've targeted the areas we need to fix yeah and, and that's what we've done i mean yeah. they've some we've, of the some of the choices may have been a little unconventional like you know mm-hmm. like tiago silva so with his age yep. but i mean one of the things that we're missing right now is the leadership and just the structure from the, the back experience and the experience that you know our last generation had and i mean right now we have dave at the back, but that's thing from the back right corner, he 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 needs to, he can't be that spine. And I think Thiago Silva coming in, you know, that was obviously our weakest point was our defense. And and yeah, you could just see we have we've recognized what we need, we've gotten it, mm-hmm. and it's promising. Whereas you know, with Van de Beek, is he going to displace Pogba? Is he going to displace Fernandez? Are they going to somehow fit all of them on the field? Uh, yep. I mean. It's yeah. It's much less yeah. convincing than the business we've done. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's actually funny, given what we are talking about this episode, that you know we have got someone for every position apart from goalkeeper, and that was probably if you'd asked someone before what was the one position you want to change, it probably would have been goalkeeper. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah no and yeah I mean, it, it's you again you're right you would get the same answer out of out of everybody but um yep. but if we do zoom out and look at the team as a whole and just you know kind of wonder like so many of the things that Kepa was criticized for or yeah. how many of those could have been stopped by a more structured and disciplined defense yep. you know like should he have even been exposed that many times like obviously we know he was been mm-hmm. And, you know, your stat of the 14 planted goals, uh, mm-hmm. I don't know, maybe maybe with a better defense stepping, those, you know, those types of shots don't happen. Um, so, you know, it'll, it will be interesting to see if Kepa does stay in the team, which I think he will. Uh, 
with the defense that we're going to have next season, how that improves his performance. I, I think it will. I mean, I, just to, to feel better about the players in front of you does a lot for your performance as a goalkeeper. Um, yeah, for sure. And, and the only place for Kepa to go from here is up. So we hope. Yeah. Um, so obviously, uh, as we were setting up to start recording, Kai Havertz was announced officially. And I just want to ask if you think uh, the deal for Kai Havertz was necessary, given the depth we already have. Yeah, I mean, look, it's you can kind of put into two arguments. One, it's Kai Havertz. I kind of think he's a generational talent. I mean, he, if he's available and right now in the position that Chelsea's in versus the other clubs and you know buying power and if if we could get Kai Havertz we get Kai Havertz um Mm -hmm. you know but to really look at it from a squad perspective still yes uh I think he could just bring so much to the team I know there were comparisons people were saying he was kind of like a mix of uh Michael Ballack and you know Mm -hmm. Ozil which that sounds awesome uh (laughs) yeah I mean, that's how, uh, just to think about the balls that Ozil used to play, like when he did actually play, uh, where you know he's got he's kind of like a Fabregas in that he's just got this precision placement and he mm-hmm. can just really f- change the flow of the game. Um, and also, like I think we mentioned earlier, Kai Havertz is twenty one. It's it's something to really look forward to for the next few years because whatever we see yeah. this season, it's only going to get better. Definitely. Um, I think one thing that's really interesting is when you think about how many players we've brought in, you know, what the kit numbers are all going to be. Uh, Yeah, I think there's going to be a big, you know, kind of interesting to see who's going to get the number 10. It's actually something that I'm pretty excited to see. I I made a video today um, talking about why I believe uh, Pulisic should get the number 10. So... I'm um, sure if you agree on that or I do I mean um I just I feel especially with the you know comparisons and I've seen the videos compare and stats comparing them to Hazard and uh mm-hmm. and to know that Hazard had 10 and just they're a very similar type of player but mm-hmm. also at the same time it's like Pulisic has proven that he he's gonna fight for this club he's gonna fight for that shirt he's gonna fight for yep. getting his spot he's gonna work and I mean uh, don't get me wrong, Havertz, amazing. Glad we got him, but mm-hmm. he still has something to prove in the Chelsea mm-hmm. shirt. Definitely, um, that's pretty much exactly what I think. Uh, you know, he had 0.68 goal contributions per ninety this season, which you know, which is remarkable when you consider it was his first season in the Premier League and he was coming off an injury for most of it. And and look from. Uh, pre-COVID to post-COVID, I mean, that's the thing. And he's yeah, got, he got it, big. He got bigger too. You know, he he put yeah. on he put on some mass. And I mean, that's the thing. He just started going at defenders. He didn't care. Yeah. It was just if he had the ball, he's driving at you. And it, it's yeah, it, it's yeah. The transformation has been really really incredible to watch. I mean, uh, obviously, he is like a a hazard kind of regen, but. He's just so much more direct towards the goal, so it's just it's just amazing to see, really. Yep. If, if there was one flaw you could say Hazard had is that he was, you know, sometimes he needed to be more selfish, which yep. I, in, in a flaw, some will cuddle flaw, some wouldn't. But yeah, I mean, there were so many times you just screaming for Hazard to take the shot, you know, mm-hmm. just and he would pass it off and. I think Pulisic is not afraid to ever take that shot. And yeah, I, I think definitely. we're going to see a lot more direct, you know, direct goals from him than we did from Hazard. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's amazing when you think when Hazard left and, you know, we had the transfer ban and everything and the whole team, you know, I think the general vibe around Chelsea was just awful. Uh, everyone thought we were going to do terribly in the league. Um you know that we weren't bringing anyone, and we just lost half our goals in, you know, one player leaving, and the way we've kind of bought it around and we've made took it to our advantage, it, it's just it's brilliant to see, really. 
in a way, looking back at it, I think it could have been a little bit of a blessing in disguise. Because I mean, yeah, definitely. Because uh, obviously, with the transfer ban, has already been everybody, everybody's expectations were lowered, and it kind mm-hmm. of gave us that little bit of wiggle room to to do the rebuild that needed to happen without so much scrutiny under you know like needing so many stop gaps. It kind of let us kind of clear everything out and and mm-hmm. start fresh, which you know. It, without the transfer ban would that have been the case you know would we have had to bring in so much youth and yeah the youth that we brought in is a lot of it is what we're you know we're going with and, yeah, it, and definitely. it's and it's really good i mean if we top four i got fourth and just there's a lot of promise still you don't you, there's really not that many like ifs except for maybe like ruben right now coming back from the injury you wonder if he yeah. gets his confidence back but yeah. um but everybody else I mean, they've done enough to really show that they're they're going to be the team for next you know the next few seasons. Yeah, uh, I I definitely feel for Ruben. Um, you know, he was one of our kind of brightest players before the injury, and now that he's come back, I think he's been forgotten a little bit. Um, and and you know, I, I think it's a confidence thing for him too. You know, yeah. that, that was a bad injury, and it's just the, it was a his, bad injury. And his play style, he. We talked about Pulisic driving at players. I mean, that's for his size, and you know, Ruben had great control of the ball, and that's that was him too. He he went at players, and I don't think he's got the same confidence right now. Just in, I really hope he gets it back, but I don't think he has mm-hmm. it to to dr- do those same driving, you know, runs at players right now. Yep, agreed. Right, and on to the final question now. Um, which is if you were to sell five players, who would you sell? Uh, a couple are easy. A couple I had to really kind of debate. It was almost situational, but I think the easy ones are Emerson. You know, yep. kind of. I just I don't see him having a place at Chelsea right now. Uh, everybody's favorite, Danny Drinkwater, <laughs> um, and I, as much as I like Jorginho, I really. You know, I think I think he needs to go. I think he could bring so much more to another club. He's a specialist that we just don't really have that need for at the moment. Yep. Um, so let's see. So those, then as much as I love Mishi, mm-hmm. uh, I think you know I think it's time we let Mishi go. Uh, we've Definitely. you know we've given him enough opportunities, and he just he he just doesn't produce and. Uh, you know his social media presence and everything. I like him as a person, but yeah, I think it's yep. time to get him off the books. No, now how many was that? Was that four? That was four. That was four. So let's see, my fifth. Zach Foster, wasn't it? <sighs> yeah. Well, and I had Kepa written down too, but that's we need to keep. Yeah. yeah we need to get the value back. We already talked about that, but uh, but yeah, Zappa Costa. And yes. You know, I know he's on loan at the moment. Um. But. You know, I just he was kind of one of those players we brought in. And you just kind of wondered where is he ever going to fit. I I have a two which are a bit more controversial. So I have Jorginho, Emerson, and Drinkwater. I also put Zappacosta in brackets. Not really sure if I can include him because obviously he's out on loan. But I have put in Christensen and also Ross Barkley. So. So the Christensen one, I can, depending on which way I look at it from, I could agree with. But um, the Barkley one, I don't know. I just, <sighs> something about Barkley has just, it's kind of like the same, somewhat of the same fight that Pulisic has. It's like, I don't think he was ever the right fit, but yep. I think he tries to be. And I kind of, you know, kind of have to appreciate that in a way. But, I mean, he's shown flashes of brilliance. Um but that's all they've ever been were flashes, you know. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, I think being English, you know, it's it's he's valuable in that sense. But um, yeah, uh, Christensen, I could see going because he really he really hasn't proven to be you know what we thought he would. Uh, yeah, I, th- I definitely. think he I think he did fit in much better when he was at uh, Munch and Gladbach. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, I guess it was just you know the league and the type of play, but uh, yeah, I think with you know um, 
with Zuma and Rudiger and uh, Tamori. I just I, I, yeah. And, well, is Ampadu coming back to the club or is he going back out on loan? Well, it, it hasn't been hasn't been said yet. I'd I'd kind of like him to stay if I'm going to be honest, but I also obviously see the benefit of him getting experience going out on loan. Yep, and, and look, I've I've always liked Ampadu. I mean, if he were to stay, I just hope there's enough game time for him. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, all that said, uh, Christensen, I could see, you know, if we were to get rid of anybody, yeah, I could see it being Christensen. Just, yep. I don't think he's going to partner as well with the other other central defenders we could have. And uh, yeah, I, I can't argue with that one. But as far as uh, you know. If Zappacost is off the table because he's on loan, then my other choice, which I can't remember if he is on loan or not, is, would be Kennedy. Oh, yeah. I, 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 he, I think he must be on loan. He, yeah. would, he would have to be. But, and then another loanee that, you know, I know I'm going way past the five now, but would be uh, <laughs> would be Matt Miazga. You know, I, we've, I, yeah. I just I don't I don't think yeah you know, I can't see a future at the club for Miazga either you know I, I, but I feel like at this point he is kind of one of those players that kind of accepted is just gonna keep going out on loan and we'll just mm-hmm. we'll get some value for him at some point. Yep, I think but, the the reason why I said Ross Barkley specifically was because obviously he's English and he's not too old. I think he's got quite good resale value right now. But I don't think it'll be as high after next season because I don't particularly think we'll use him. And yeah, I can, I would agree with that because you know, and I've kind of had to just remind myself how much homegrown talent we have now. Yeah, and uh, and that you know, I feel like when we bought Barkley and Drinkwater, we were a little bit more in a really needed situation for for English players. Um, yeah. But but no. Uh, yeah, I, I could agree that Barkley probably doesn't bring enough to the table to, you know, justify arguing him off that off that list. Yep, and I mean, same goes with Christensen. Really, he's pretty young. Uh, I think we could get, you know, not a great amount, but a decent amount. You know, money which we could re- reinvest in maybe someone like Declan Rice. I'm not sure if you're on board to the Declan Rice train, but I definitely am. Like as long as him and his buddy Mason can, yeah. you know, just keep each other hyped up and uh and yeah, no, I would I would I would definitely like to see Declan come in. I think he would be good for the squad. I think uh yeah, I think it would be a big improvement and and just that's all we can look for right now is, you know, if we can bring in solid depth and just kind of keep building for the future cuz the players we brought mm-hmm. in, they're all so young, you know. It's I, I just happy to know that after this season you know we can buy on kind of almost as need basis just yeah, um, it's good ben, to see Ben Chilwell obviously 23 as well so yeah. you, you you think that's full back um, you know that's the left back sorted for you know seven years Which, maybe longer yeah but I mean uh, it, it, it's good. just nice to see that the team is being formed the entire team is being formed at that kind of in that age range mm-hmm. too. You know, it's it's going to allow for each year to just be more and more cohesion between all the players. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I think we'll we'll end it there. All right. Well, um, no, this was. Uh, I, I appreciate you having me on. This was fun. Yeah, well, it was good to have you on, man. That was that was a um, really good, really good conversation. Yeah. No. And look, I be happy to uh be happy to do it again anytime you yeah know, just, definitely kind of kind of gotta give you props for stepping up on the subreddit and uh and starting this podcast up i mean i feel like a lot of fans will appreciate it thank you i appreciate that yeah i i think it's something that a lot of us have wanted but maybe people just uh you know they haven't just really got around to doing it and i haven't got much to do at the moment and i just thought <laughs> you know let's just do it and I f- you know obviously the feedback was really good so yeah should be good well he picked a good time to do it when we got the have type and uh, yeah definitely just, and, and just and look I think you know to look at the COVID 
you know era from a from a light lighter side it's kind of the fact that football was able to come back before everything else you know and Pulisic I think mm-hmm. it kind of brought a lot of new fans into you know into the game into Chelsea just uh you know yeah Pulisic has done the club a good favor by you know getting a lot of Americans excited about the game too um definitely so you know you might just have to there will be a lot of people calling it soccer yeah. just have to deal with, <laughs> just have to deal with that but uh <laughs> But other than that, yeah, it's a good time to be a Chelsea fan. Yeah, definitely. Um, I guess I'll wrap it up here then. Uh, we Basically, to summarise, we both think Kepa should just be fighting for the first spot next season and not the out-and-out goalkeeper. Um, and yeah, it's been really interesting. Yeah, so, I don't know, I just... One more season, then yeah. then maybe we won't have to worry about him anymore. Definitely. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm going to end it there. <laughs>